Good morning, Hope Point. How are you doing today? Glad to be in God's house. If you're joining us online, welcome to Hope Point. I, um, I hadn't seen that video. That was amazing. What a God story. Can we give Walona a hand? That's so cool. It's really awesome. As God would have it, Walona, you're preaching my sermon today, so it's going to be good. I want to uh, just reiterate, Pastor Allen said, I would, Amy and I went to camp even though we're old and uncool and got to connect with our kids and um, pray over kids. And uh, I just want to thank everybody um, for just for your generosity in, in helping kids get to camp. Um, my life was changed at camp. I know Pastor Amy's was and so many others. And uh, you could see the difference. And um, I think what Pastor Allen said is so true. Uh, without the next generation of the church, it's extinct. And I'm so thankful that the next generation of the church at Hope Point is alive and strong and well and has a biblical worldview. Uh, that they look at the world through the lens of biblical principles and biblical truth. Come on, is anybody out there? That's worth it right there. So thank you. We're getting into a new sermon series today, and I'm really excited to dive into the Word with you. Are you excited about God's Word? It's eternal. It's life-giving. Eight of you, that's good. Are you excited about God's Word? Come on. The quieter you are, the longer I'll preach today. I'm just playing. Let's bow your heads. We're going to go to God and just thank Him for the Word. God, we're so thankful for all the life change that's happened this week. God, we're thankful in advance for what you're going to do in each and every person's life here today. And Father, I thank you that we come to you with a heart of expectation. Father, believing in greater. Father, we thank you that your presence and your spirit is here today. We thank you that we get to come to the table of the Lord today as a family. And Father, we get to receive what you have for us so that we can go and be lights in a dark place. We give you praise. We give you glory for your word. We give you permission to completely wreck us, Jesus, for the gospel. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name all God's people said, amen. If, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Mark. Mark is in the New Testament. It's chapter 12. Uh, it goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuter. I'm not going through all of that. But then you get to the New Testament, and you'll hit Matthew and Mark. Mark was pro likely one of the first apologists, one of the first evangelists. His uh, gospel is the backbone for the other three. And so um, Mark's got something to say. Mark is typically short and sweet. He gets to the point. And so today we're going to look at, at how God used him to talk about an amazing story in Scripture. This, this message is called Audacious Sacrifice. And one of the things that I know, no matter what you do in the kingdom of God, God loves faith. We talked about the hall of faith last last eight weeks or nine weeks or so, and I thought that this would be a great uh, series. I had another one planned. I felt like God spoke to me about this one, and this is based on faith. And so audacious sacrifice, one of the things that I realize the longer I walk with God is that, number one, I cannot outbless God. I can't outbless Him. I can't outgive God, and I will never be able to repay God for all that He's done for me. There's a few things. Uh, some of you don't realize that, it sounds like. I can never outbless God. You can't either. You can never outgive God. Can't do that. And you can never repay Him for everything He's done. So the very best that we can do is give Him everything. And when you look at audacious sacrifice and what that really means, I know that sacrifice that costs us something unlocks the supernatural power of God in our life. And I'm not talking about this exchange or this investment program or name it, claim it stuff. I'm talking about when you get real with God and God walks with each and every one of us and you know when he's talking to you, you know when he's moving on you, you know when he's, uh, when he's leading and guiding you. Um, I wish uh, Pastor Steve would sh could share this himself, but I rem I'll never forget he told me when we were building this addition, he just kept saying, just build it bigger, just build it bigger. And I said, Dad, bigger's always more. 
It always costs more. It always more. He said, you're going to need it for more people, son. I said, really? Why do you say that? He said, because when we built this building, it was a fourth of the size that it is now. That's, we bought steel for this building to be one-fourth the size that it is back in 1987. And I, I didn't know that. And, and he said, a pastor from Mexico had come and a missionary pastor there and had told me, um, you need four times the steel. And he said, that's crazy. I can't afford that. There's no way we can do that. And he said, well, that's what God said because there's a lot more people coming to your church than you realize. And so there happened to be a missionary in Haiti, and we had raised money because we built this building debt-free, which uh, by we, I don't mean me. My, my dollar in kids' church did help. <laughs> don't get, and we're going to talk about that today. Do not ca discount the widow's might. But, so I helped build this too. God used me, Dad, my pennies and my quarters. Come on. How, how many of you are happy for all the generous kids at Hope Point, right? Come on. You teach them now, they do it later. So, so anyway, uh, we had given a lot of the building fund money to a missionary in Haiti. I think we'd given it all. And um, God, because he needed, he needed something, and we just knew when you give, you receive, right? That, that's how God works. That's what Jesus said. And so we did that, and God supernaturally moved in an amazing way. And, you know, 30 years later, we, we had all this, and um, four times bigger than we planned, and absolutely no debt for it. And so it that's audacious sacrifice, though, isn't it? To give everything for the work of God somewhere else to people that probably need it more and you realize that God blesses your life and and so when I talk about this series this is not a financial series it's not a money series this is a heart series this is a series on what God wants to do in and through you to unlock his supernatural power in our church in a way that we've never seen and I realize that God will always honor sacrifice. David, when he was buying the land for the temple that would be the temple on the mountain, it would be and still is, the temple is still situated there to this day. He went to a man named Arana and he said, I want to buy your threshing floor where you thresh wheat. I'm going to build the house of the Lord here. And Arana says, well, you can just have it for free. You could take it. You're the king and you want to do something noble. And David said, uh-uh. I will not offer to my God something that costs me nothing. Come on. Come on. I will not offer to my God something that costs me nothing. And he said, it should cost me something. And somehow God is still using David's work throughout the earth two, 3,000 years later to bless us. So, I'm going to talk to you today about sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. This message is called, Spend It All in One Place. And you've heard the, the saying, don't spend it all in one place. I want you and, you and I to spend our lives in one place, and that is building the kingdom of God. Building the kingdom of God. Sacrifice, destruction or surrender of something for the sake of something else. Destruction or surrender of something for the sake of something else. It reminds me of Romans 12, therefore, uh, 1 and 2. Uh, therefore, uh, in view of this, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your holy, pleasing, and accept acceptable act to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, right? Something given up or lost. To suffer loss, give up, renounce, injure, destroy, especially for an ideal belief or end, to sell at a loss. It reminds me of the person that the merchant that found the great pearl of great price, right? The pearl of great price. He, he sold it all to find that pearl. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a merchant who found a great pearl, went and sold it away, right? The kingdom of God is like a man who found treasure in a field. When he found the treasure, he went and sold everything he had and bought that field. If you don't get what Jesus is saying, he said, give it all. Give it all. Give everything for the kingdom. So, so I love this passage of Scripture because it comes from Ecclesiastes and Solomon, one of the wisest men on the planet. He says, what do people really get for all their hard work? I've seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted, everybody say planted. He's planted eternity in the human heart. 
so that people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. That, that God somehow knows, and by the way, no matter if you're uh, uh, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Christian, whatever you are, almost the entire world believes that when you breathe your last, something else happens. Almost the entire world, whether they're Christian or not. They go, nope, that ain't it. God, there, there's an eternity that God has planted in your heart. There's this sense of this is the door to something else. That death is a door to something else. So Jesus reinforces that concept when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Do not sort for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust and th uh, decay and thieves break in and steal, but sort for yourselves treasures in all right, this is the participation part where we go, okay. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven. Here, how it works is if I leave a blank, you get to jump in. Isn't that cool? And, and, and if you don't know the verses, that's okay. You don't have to feel disconnected. It's all right. You can learn them. Trust me. But, but store for yourselves treasure in heaven. Where moth and rust do not decay and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. Also, Oh, there we go. Awesome. So let me talk to you about the curse of the thorn. We're going to talk about God's intent and how, how, how we've kind of messed that up and, and then bring it full circle. The curse of the thorn, uh, when, when mankind rebelled against the divine creator, God in, in heaven, when Adam and Eve sinned and, 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 and led a revolt like Satan, God put them under a curse since you he's talking to adam and this is a whole nother topic this is probably a men's conference since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit i commanded you not to eat the ground is cursed because of you all your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it it will grow thorns and thistles for you though you will eat of its grains by the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. So we get a few curses there. Number one, we get the curse of organics, right? That God made us from the dust, and now death enters the human race because of sin. So to dust we shall return. Uh, carbon, our carbon footprint, right? Uh, by the sweat of your brow, the curse of the thorn comes in, doesn't it? It says that it's going to be hard for you, that, that thorns and thistles will grow up for you. So, so there's hard labor, and there's distraction from building what matters. I want you to see that. That thorns are simply a distraction from building what matters. Because God called them to do something different in the garden than they had originally done. And, and if you don't know this, then you're going to have a different perspective on your stewardship and on how you live life. But I want to tell you God's intent was very different. Because if you notice, the Bible gives definite parameters for the Garden of Eden. And, and, and it's between the, Euphra the Euphrates and the Trigus, right? So you've got these two rivers flowing through what is modern-day Iraq, ironically. And, and, and we know that, that the garden was somewhere in that region. And, but, so, but God created the whole world. So the garden was his throne room on earth. And he called mankind to extend the garden to make the rest of the world look like the garden. Are you with me? That there's actually joy and fulfillment in doing the work that God has called you to. That, you know, that we get to be like him. He said, you know what? I don't have to keep all this for myself. I would love for my creation, my image bearers, to extend what I have started. Are you following me? To extend what I have started and extend this to the whole world. Now, while it was good, he didn't say that all of it was perfect. So I want you to see that. But the Bible says that the Lord God placed man in the garden to tend it and watch over it, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it. So I'm placing you here, but you're to expand everywhere. Are you following me? You see that? They got that up for you so you can take pictures, do whatever, write it down, take a note, put it on your forehead, I don't know. The reality is, you get something, you start to see that God's intent was to smart, start and then grow. 
that he was to start with you and then grow. What's interesting is because we're created like our Heavenly Father, we, we're supposed to see the potential in what could be. You can't extend the garden and look at the world without seeing the potential in what can be. Because what you see is the garden, and that's God's design. And then you go, wow, the rest of the world, I can help make like that. I can see the potential in the world and what could be. So God called you to be like him. It's kind of like how God saw the potential in darkness and said, let there be light. I can see what could be. The James Webb Telescope is actually taking pictures of all that light that traveled so long ago when God said, let there be light, right? And at 192,000 miles per second, light started shooting out of God's mouth and creating the world that we now have. And so when you think about God's intent, you begin to see that we're supposed to find potential in what he has. So we're, all, we're the only part of God's creation. I want you to hear this, church. And it's one of the reasons life is so precious that received the breath of God. Everything else he spoke, but he breathed. We are the only ones that received the breath of God. So because we have the breath of God, then we can speak the life, light, and will of God. It's why Proverbs says the tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Why? Because God does something. It's stupid. They even, even Paul said preaching is foolishness. Like, who would do that? How, why would God use preaching to, to affect any change in anybody's life? Why? Because the power of the Word of God, when spoken, it does not return void. It produces what He intended for it to produce. And some simple word from God's Word, from the Logos, from the Scriptures, hits your heart and opens up faith. And the Holy Spirit mixes with that and begins to unlock something that brings about a transformation and a supernatural power in your life to do something. Which is why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God was revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. So here's what I want to show you. How do you get saved? You can confess, and we're going to we're gonna play this game again. If you, if you what? With your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and eight of you got that. And in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you need the verse. I'm not making it up. Your speech is a critical part of, and whether you spend eternity in heaven with God or in hell apart from him. That little thing right there. You say, that's stupid. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You don't know the power of speech then. You obviously didn't read the Bible because God spoke everything into existence. You don't think speech is powerful? Every world that was created was done through speech. Are you feeling me? Your voice is a big deal. So the, the curse is distraction from building what matters. The curse is making things that God designed to be fulfilling difficult and challenging. I want you to see this. God desires that we speak his will into things that are not as he intended. I'll give you a verse for that. Put it up. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations, he said to Abraham. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. That he calls things that do not currently exist how he designed them like they exist. So it's why when he comes to Abraham, he said, Father of many nations. Abraham's going, I got no kids. But you will. So I'm just letting you know now for later. Then he calls us to do the exact same things, which is why God says, Jesus says to the disciples, you can 
try to move this mountain and it'll be removed into the sea no didn't say that he said you don't have enough faith i tell you the truth if you had faith as small as a mustard seed you could you could say everybody say say you could say to this mountain i i don't have to work it up i don't have to do uh uh, 30, 30, 30, 30 different acts of kindness. I don't have to, uh, you know, do some mantra. No, you just say to that mountain, be moved. And it will be cast into the sea. Nothing would be impossible. So full circle. And I love this passage of scripture. Then we're going to dive into Mark. Listen, this is Jesus talking, not me. I know you're listening. But he told the disciples, listen. Listen. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath. The birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Okay. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil. They produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Listen to understand. Going further, the disciples didn't know what he was talking about. So, and that's okay. By the way, if you don't know what Jesus is talking about, if you don't know what, what, what things are about in church, just ask. They did all the time. What's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of that? What's the meaning of this? I don't know. Let's ask Jesus. And they found out. So then he goes to explain what seed does what. I want to focus on one seed, the thorns. Because this is the curse of the thorn. He says, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. Right? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. So the whole goal is to strip faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So the whole goal is to what? Strip faith. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't actually say that the plant dies. The plant looks like every other, like the good plant. It looks exactly like the good plant, the one that produced 30, 60, 100 fold. The difference is it never produces anything. It's, it didn't say that it died. It didn't say that it looked weird, so the farmer didn't like it. It didn't say that. It says that it, so no fruit is produced. So Satan really happy for all the Christians to just meander on to heaven. And not affect anybody or do anything to extend God's kingdom. Curse of the thorn. Hey, I'm going, I'm doing my thing. And, and here's what Jesus said. Any plant that does not bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. So Satan knows, I will just let them go along their merry way. Then they're going to have to deal with God when they get there. You see what I'm getting at, church? You can look right. You can look right. You can look like the good plant. The one that produces 30, 60, 100 fold. But in your life, is there the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control? Is there the fruit of seeing those that you love, those that you know, be impacted for eternity? Is there the fruit of building something that will last far beyond yourself? I have to ask you, because the Bible says that they get choked out by the worries of this life. The thorn. Just getting distracted, building something that isn't going to last. Just getting distracted from building what we shouldn't. You hear what I'm saying to you today? Just getting distracted from wasting the only thing that you can never get back, which is time. Just getting distracted. I was so happy to see some of the men in the church just killing it with the kids. Like, 
I mean, these are adult men. These are career men. These are guys that got stuff to do. These are guys that pull a hammy when they walk onto the field. You know what I'm saying? We're a little bit older now. And man, they were mixing it up with the kids, just loving life and doing it. They wanted to invest in something eternal. In kids that weren't their own. So that they might connect with Christ. I'm telling you, if you're one of those men, you got some kids on your account in heaven. The ones that are going to get baptized in our 11 o'clock service, there's some of them. So thank you. But the reality is God planted eternity. We planted thorns, but God planted eternity. I want you to see this. So the curse of the man and the woman deal with pain and reproducing. For the man, the work of his hands. For women, procreation. Sometimes... We don't realize what that means. If you still don't believe in the curse of the thorn, what did they wrap around and put on Jesus' head? They tried to put, the Romans did not even know it, but they tried to put the curse of mankind on his head. Head is the seat of authority, so it's the place of dominance. They said, we want the curse of man to dominate you. And Jesus took on the curse, yet was not dominated by it, but overcame it. Once you see that, because isn't it so random? They're like, you're like, I mean, there's other ways to hurt him. Why thorns? Crown of thorns. Want you to see that. It's so important. So, things are not always as they seem. It's why they miss Jesus. Want you to see that. It's why all the people looking at the law miss Jesus. How is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. He's saying, God said to Jesus, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? What he's saying is, all you Pharisees think that the Messiah will be the son of David. What you don't realize is that David was calling me Lord back then. David's my son. Are you getting this? They missed it. If you misinterpret, here's the problem. If we misinterpret the Logos, then we will misinterpret the Logos, Jesus, the Word. If you misinterpret the Scripture, then you will misinterpret Jesus. Jesus cannot be separated from His Word. He is the fulfillment. He is the embodiment of the word. So you can't say Jesus said this, but he didn't say that. No, 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 no. He's the fullest expression of the word. He said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Okay? So just, to, just for all of our deconstructionist Christians out there, that doesn't work. That argument doesn't play. just want to make that very apparent. So here's what he tells them. Because he's saying, you didn't see me because you judged me. You judged the, the, the book by the cover. So, so he's talking with the disciples, and he says, as he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes, be greeted in the marketplaces, and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Jesus reinforces the concept of even though they look good on the outside, watch out what's on the inside. And even though I don't look good on the outside, I'm really good on the inside. You got it? He says, hey, what did they want to do? Be known, be, be popular publicly, have the seats of power, have the seats of honor. They were greedy. They were sincerely pious. All these things seem to look good on the outside, but they don't look good on the inside. So here's how you can spend it all in one place. Things aren't always as they seem. You don't realize that when you sow and you make an investment in the kingdom, that it's going to grow. And it's going to produce 30, 60, 100 fold. It just happens differently. You don't know when you pray for somebody over and over and over again that the grace of God is working over time in their life to break down every argument and knowledge itself, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God to try and draw them to Christ. Sometimes they just seem to get more bitter, don't they? you just keep praying and you keep praying and you don't realize that that's 30 60 100 fold and that once that person breaks free and once they get one to the lord they're going to win like 3000 you don't get you, you don't see that some of the craziest people were the most impactful in the kingdom of god 
So here's what Jesus does in Mark 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. So everybody's bringing their money to church. They're giving their money to church. Jesus is kind of sitting down opposite of the treasury. So he's sitting down opposite of where they're making their, uh, their, their, their gifts, their, tithe, their offering to the church. It says, many rich people threw in large amounts. So there were lots of people there. There were some, a lot of rich people that threw in large amounts of money at that time. It says, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put into the treasury more than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. Put in what? No, no, no. Put in what? Come on, put in what? All she had. All she had. Audacious sacrifice. But a poor widow, the, the, the widow's mite is something that people talk a lot about. Two mites was a Greek lepta. Together, they were worth the quadrants. And that the quadrants was the smallest coin. Mites were actually pieces of a coin. You had to have 26 of them to buy one loaf of bread. So if you think of two, you can't even get a slice. I just want you to see that. This is the level of poverty that we're talking about here. This is, uh, and, and because uh, she's a widow, she cannot inherit property, nor really does she have much of an income to speak of because she would be kind of like uh, Naomi and, and those going out to thresh wheat, what was left over. Uh, she wouldn't have had a, a much of a job uh, because she was a widow and likely elderly, um, and there was no retirement system in, in Israel. So, so she's trying to figure it out. Notice she has no name. Mark, who is meticulous, gives no name. The name of the person who made the sacrifice of such incredible need. She isn't climbing a ladder. She's trust falling into a kingdom. And I think that's important. She's trust falling into the kingdom. She's not, she's not trying to get up anywhere. Not trying to get a position, a seat, or whatever else. She's just trust falling into the kingdom of God. There's an audacious sacrifice to this lady. And I would just encourage you, build his kingdom, not your ladder. Just build his kingdom, not your ladder. We would never know anything about this woman without her sacrifice. Like, like the only thing that defines her is her sacrifice. That's it. <laughs> it's crazy. The, it, it's, not, it's not any other gift. This woman has no gifts, spiritual gifts to speak of that we know of. She has, she, 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 she does not have a place of honor. She, 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 I mean, she's nondescript. The only reason we know about her is because of her audacious sacrifice. That's it. Crazy sacrifice. And it came with such a high price that oblivion wouldn't suffice. God had to put her in the book, man. He said, you know what? We're reading about her 2,000 years later. We don't know her name. Jesus paid attention to her complete discretion. She didn't go, oh, you know, here's some money. She didn't up an inch. She didn't. She just did her thing between her and God. Don't let the right hand know what the left one's doing. Jesus said all that, all that kind of stuff. Calling his disciples to him. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more treasure than all the others. He did not discount what other people had done. I want you to see that. He just noticed that it was out of abundance. It wasn't out of sacrifice. That, 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 that there was something to what she did that, 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 get, that gave everything. And she's accredited as giving more. Why? Because her circumstances dictated that she really needed the money. More desperately needed for the essentials of life. I've heard so many try to undermine this and say, oh, well, you can just give whatever you want. No, you can, you, you can tithe or give everything. That's, what, that's the message. That's the only thing you can get from that. It's the only thing you extrapolate from the Word, from a biblical mindset. 
She, Jesus isn't using this woman to do that. She put in everything she had. I want you to see that. And here's, here's, what, here's what happens when you lay it all down. And I think this is profound. She never knew that Jesus was talking about her. <laughs> she never knew that the Son of God, hear me now, that the God incarnate, the one that made her, the one that breathed everything, is sitting down giving an object lesson on her life. She never knew that he called all of his disciples, the big, the, the heavy hitters, Peter, James, and John, right? And then, then all the others. He never, she never knew that Jesus took notice of her audacious sacrifice. She never knew that she would be written about, that her sacrifice would echo into all of eternity. She never knew, like the woman with the alabaster jar, that she, that what she did, it was so crazy, so audacious audacious, so generous, so sacrificial, so loving and gracious to Christ that nobody would ever realize it then, but it would echo throughout eternity that heaven would hear about it and that all of us would hear about it. I'm telling you, something supernatural broke out and Mark was so impacted. Mark wasn't even there. You know who had to, my, my, oh, the disciples had to say, Mark, if you had, have you had seen what this woman did, Jesus was impacted by it. He was touched by it. He was moved by it. I wonder if you realize that Jesus is waiting to brag on you in heaven. I wonder if you realize that when it's tough, when it's hard, just like maybe Wilona was saying, which is incredible, I didn't even know she was going to preach that today, <laughs> preaching my message, that, that, that when you realize that, that when people aren't looking, when people don't know, that maybe there's a God in heaven that would say, hey, you know something? I want you to observe my servant Job. I want you to observe my servant uh, Sharon. I want you to observe my servant Paul. I want you to observe my servant Ron. I want you to observe my... You begin to see that God is bragging. That there's something that echoes in eternity when you get it right. You need to spend it all in one place, church. You need to give your heart everything that you are. Therefore, in view of his mercy, in view of all of these things, let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our reasonable act of service. It's not even audacious. It's reasonable. But when you get audacious, here's what you have to see. Live silent. If you want to echo through eternity, live silent. She didn't say anything. She just said, God, I obviously am going to trust you. And I don't mean like in the next for my retirement. I mean like for my next meal. Boom. That's all I got. But I know that you're good. See, you don't do that if you don't have a right perspective of God. See, this woman had to know God is my provider. Oh, it gets, it's, it's going to get real. God is my provider. Not my 401k, not my stock options, not my money, not my business. Not, no, God is my provider. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can do whatever he wants to do. He'll give me, I know he's righteous. There are two things I've seen, David said. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. I know that God is my provider. That's it. And I know that he's good. And I know that he loves me. And so if I give him everything and I build his house, this great temple, if I build this thing, then he will take charge over me. At some point you realize that it had nothing to do with what she gave and it had everything to do with the fact that her entire faith 
was placed in him and that her giving and her sacrifice and her joy overflowed and was just a reflection. It was just a reflection of what God was doing in her life. And church, when we live like that, God will break something out supernaturally and there will come blessing and there will come provision and there will come healing and there will come grace and and don't get this twisted you don't buy anything from God all good gifts come from him he's given us everything the least that we can do is give him our everything. Would you bow your heads with me today? I'd like to invite our prayer team to come. I know that there's healing in this house today. I know that there's grace in this house today. I know that there's peace in this house today. I know that there's joy in this house today. And if you find yourself low in any one of those things, I want you to come and receive prayer at the end of this service. You say, well, why would I do that? Because the Bible says that you should. And I can't argue with the Bible. It's the only book that we have. I'd like to ask anybody here today, maybe you're online, maybe you're in these seats. Now's your chance. Would you like to give it all for him? Would you like to exchange our filthy rags for his righteousness? Our death and eternal damnation for his abundant and eternal life. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice and it's a surrender. It's not roses. It's not meadows and God, God blesses your life for sure, but um, it's the real work of the kingdom. It's hard. It's dying. It's taking up yourself, denying yourself, taking up your cross, following him. The cross is a sign of death. We lose our life so that we can find it in him. And there's a creator in heaven that breathed you into existence, made you, formed you in your mother's womb, and breathed his life into you. And he loves you and he doesn't want you to be apart from him. So if there's anybody here today, I want to invite you to say, I'd like to surrender my life. I'd like to, I'd like to confess Jesus, not just believe in my heart, but I want to confess Jesus. I'm, we're all going to say a prayer here. And if you would like to do that, I want to give you the opportunity. It's so important. I want you to just acknowledge that with every head bowed, every eye closed. I want you to acknowledge that. I just want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to pray that with the church. I'm going to pray that for my seat. I'm not going to call you up, but I want, I want you to do that right now if that's you. I just want you to raise your hand and say, I need to do that. I need to confess that, that I need Jesus in my life. I need to surrender my life. I need to make him the Lord of my life. So good right now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, come into my life. I make you my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I repent of my sin. I take up my cross, and I follow you, believing you paid a price I couldn't when you died on the cross, believing you rose again and conquered death and hell so that I could have life. I thank you for saving me, and I promise to serve you all my days. In Jesus' name, amen.